hello everybody this is the first online uh, session uh, it's a, a kind of an introductory session uh, for you uh, this uh, relates to the material we have already discussed in the class but uh, I also wanted to test uh, my ability to record online lecture so it would be better to start from here and this will also help some of you who didn't uh, attend the class last time. Uh, our regular class will continue uh, uh, from the next week. Uh, if you remember in the last two three lectures we talked about English literature in the Middle Ages. So uh, I don't know how to uh, point to particular areas of the uh, mind map that you are seeing uh, on the screen but I hope that uh, you will follow me during the course of uh, this uh, uh, lecture <coughs> we start with uh, uh, the Norman conquest and I told you that uh, Norman conquest uh, refers to uh, the arrival of William who was the Duke of Normandy in France. It was a place in northern France, um, uh, you can say a province and uh, William. I also talked about uh, the family relations and other uh, connections that these uh, Norman people had with uh, the English people. So in 1066 AD William conquered uh, England and uh, since then uh, we have a line that uh, uh, historians divide to uh, differentiate and uh, um, you know identify the Anglo-Saxon period and the Middle Ages. When you talk about the Middle Ages uh, you should realize that with the arrival of the French rulers uh, under the leadership of William they were French speaking community so they when reached England they occupied uh, different offices and uh, um, places of authority and uh, uh, powerful positions so French in a sense became the official language of England. Uh, although we are uh, not dealing with a language or other political aspects uh, uh, but understanding the socio, the political, the economic, the religious and other aspects of history are important to understand and appreciate the literature of that time. So when the French arrived we see that uh, people in uh, England the powerful, the rich they shifted their focus from understanding and learning and mastering in English studies toward French and there was another competitor in the form or in the shape of Latin language which was a symbol of religious scholarship for the people of that time. So three competing languages were there uh, Latin, French and English. Of course Greek had its uh, importance that we can't deny at that time but for the sake of convenience and as understanding we keep these three languages languages at the front. When we talk about these three languages we should also know that English did not enjoy uh, a respectable you can say or a, a position where you can declare it as a breadwinner. So most of the times it would be spoken by common people uh, to perform their daily routine activities and uh, not far beyond that. Generally we see that uh, 
uh, English was uh, used by the lower clergy uh, you can say the religious clerics they would teach they would uh, preach and they would guide the um, people the local people in English language but when it came to the power circles French dominated and of course Latin remained as a powerful tool and a powerful weapon to gain mastery in the field of religion and we should also remember that uh, religion at that time was a very powerful force so there was a distinctive position held by those who had religious scholarship so here we come to this uh, uh, establishing the point that the wealthy the rich and those who had the means and the resources would go for learning French and Latin and those who spoke English would not find uh, many opportunities to prosper so investment in English language was bound to reduce its importance started diminishing but then you know that we talked about uh, certain events that had significant bearing on the rise of English language in the coming years one such event was uh, when the English lost Normandy to France and then the royal decree which banned owning of land and property at both places in both in France and in England before 1224 the English rulers coming over from Normandy had the legal right to retain their properties in Normandy and also in England but this royal decree banned this mechanism and the people were given the option either to go for this side and for the, or for that side so this in a sense gave rise to uh, Englishness nationalism you can say English patriotism or ownership of the English society or the English people or the uh, English culture and at the same time uh, an initiation of the process of alienation from uh, the French roots so when we reach here we come to know that slowly and gradually English uh, culture English language and English people started uh, taking their roots again so this is, uh, you can say, the social or the political aspect of the history of the Middle Ages. Now we come to the left side of uh, the mind map that is uh, on the screen. And we talk about certain important figures uh, whose contribution uh, is remembered in the history uh, who had significant bearing upon the history of English people in the following years. One such figure was Geoffrey and uh, you know that we talked about his uh, work uh, Historia Regum Brittany and uh, we also know that uh, he mentions King Arthur and uh, his knights in this work.
although it's a Latin work, but it uh, provides an English um, tradition, you can say, or culture, or King Arthur is an English creation. So in a sense, a Latin reader would get a chance to know about the English culture and English history. And then we also talked about uh, the translation of the same by Lemon uh, in English in the 13th century for the first time. So we can say that uh, the, the process that Geoffrey had initiated allowed readers of other languages or speakers of other languages to get a taste of the English content. Then we talked about Thomas of Hales and uh, we mentioned his poem Lo, Love, Rune. Rune is um, most probably uh, its uh, etymology says that it can refer to a song or a poem. So it's a poem and then we talked about uh, vanity. I hope you know vanity. If you don't, please consult your dictionary. And I would be uh, very happy if someone of you notes this part of the lecture and provide some comments on what vanity is. And then the transience of earthly love was also the theme of that poem. And then we talked about uh, transience in detail. And you know transience refers to the transitory nature of something. You know that uh, this life is transitory it's uh, uh, fading, it's waning, and uh, it is going to, you know, we have small years to spend in this world. So whatever we see in this world is transient, at least for we as individuals. Like We admit that this world has been there for centuries, but not for individuals. Individuals come and they go and when they go they leave it forever so in comparison there is another thing which is eternal and this must be noted that this is a religious uh, interpretation of life those who do not believe in religion or those who do not uh, follow religion may not agree to this argument they may have their own argument uh, to counter uh, this one but in the context we see that uh, the we can love and that love can either be transient or can be internal so transience or transient or transitory nature of love is that of uh, loving the world the material beings so when you die everything finishes but on the other hand the religious scholars the believers in religion they argue that if you love Christ if you love God that is eternal that is going to remain with you forever we as Muslims believe in the same thing, but we have a slight uh, difference of uh, belief system with uh, the Christians. We believe in God and we believe in Jesus Christ, of course. But we also believe in the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, whom we believe is the last Prophet of Allah. And we we must love all our prophets including the last prophet and then this love is going to remain with us here and in the life hereafter 
So Thomas of Hales would urge the people to indulge or to involve in love with Christ and God instead of indulging or spending time in loving things that are mortal. Coming to another figure and uh, his name is John Wycliffe. We say that uh, John Wycliffe is important for his contribution in producing the first complete translation of Bible in English. You know that if the people in England were Christians, if they were staunch believers in Christianity, they, they, they must have uh, access to Bible. But then uh, Bible was not available in their language. So those people who did not understand other languages would find it difficult to understand what actually the Bible was about. And they had only to rely on the uh, local clergy, the priests, to know about Bible. But uh, Wycliffe, when he translated, provided a chance to a common English person, common uh, English man in England and of course in the rest of the world speaking English to taste Bible for themselves, to read it, to understand it, to interpret it and to of course improve life according to the, Jesus, uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about Thomas of Hales, John Wycliffe, Geoffrey or Lehman or Ways, please remember that these are not the only authors or the, not the only contributors in Middle English. There are other important figures. And then, of course, if you talk about these people, the, the works that we have mentioned in uh, this map are not the only uh, contributions that they have made. There are, so the point is there are several other writers, there are several other scholars, and they have several works to their credit uh, which uh, contribute to the history of uh, English literature in the Middle Ages. But due to scarcity of time, we do not talk about all the writers or scholars and of course uh, all their works. So for you as students, you are expected to read uh, the recommended book and there you will find some other good works and some other good writers. So please make a note of them and uh, include them uh, in your study material for uh, future references. Because this is just the beginning for you. All that you need right now is to uh, develop a taste for history and uh, slowly and gradually when you will uh, promote will be promoted to the next or the third, fifth, eighth semester. It is hoped that you will find more information and more time to know about uh, different uh, literary figures in the history of English literature. Now we come to uh, the last part of our discussion and uh, that uh, relates to uh, romance. You know that uh, we had a, a good amount of discussion on romance and uh, its uh, essentials. For the evening students, I think that this part of the lecture will be somehow new. So I would uh, invite the attention of uh, that class to uh, attend to this part of the lecture and to understand uh, what we mean by uh, a romance. Uh, 
when we talk about romance we should remember that uh, romance has its own flavor like for example a hero in romance would fight uh, uh, on principle maybe for fashion and not necessarily for pursuing a specific object as was uh, in the case in uh, heroic poetry i hope you remember the heroic poetry anglo-saxon poetry and uh, the wonders that beowulf did uh, to his people and to his neighbors another important characteristic of romance is that uh, in a romance the the hero uh, would be loyal to a lady uh, and that loyalty is equal to that of a king and this loyalty is uh, i don't know whether we call it loyalty is done or loyalty is performed but it was a, a ritual means like you you do it as a ritual r i t u a l so it it was a ritualistic uh, approach toward loyalty in romance now uh, if uh, we look at uh, the uh, historical classification of romance we say that in medieval times in the middle ages uh there was a you can say historian or a scholar whose name was jean bodil uh, he divided a romance in 12th century into three categories according to him the first category is that of matter of france and uh, we talked about matter of france there is a uh, a hero and his knights and uh, of course the brave deeds and the heavy fights the show of courage is all there in matter of france like the matter of britain or matter of rome as far as the stuff is concerned it remains the same uh, some students in the class uh, asked me about uh, the example of chanson de roland so chanson de roland is an example of the of uh, a romance in the category of matter of france and uh, it is uh, again you know that uh, chanson de roland is a song of roland so it's again a song of the wonders and the brave deeds performed by the hero when you come to the matter of britain uh, in in uh, this category uh, is uh, we give more importance to this category because we are students of uh, english literature so we say that uh, uh, the english romance would talk about arthurian legends king arthur and the legends associated with him his round table and the knights that uh, the 12 knights that were there with him and of course there is a concept of courtly love too so before moving forward we need to briefly highlight what do we mean by courtly love uh if you remember we talked about uh, love uh, in romance uh, that it is not like uh, physical uh, concept of love that we have or a kind of a madness also we know that some people define or identify love 
uh, in its uh, physical manifestations or maybe mentally uh, people call it a kind of a madness so it's not like that uh, it's a kind of a service in romance service means a slave and a master if someone is the lover is the slave and uh, the lady would be the master too mm. the slave would be ready would be willing to suffer any kind of indignity for the lady so it's a kind of a service in which a master is served and uh, the slave would serve and suffer in indignity for the beloved another important characteristic of uh, courtly love is that uh, a slight favor uh, toward the slave or to the lover will be more than enough you know just once in life for example how can i say if you smile just once should be enough for someone to suffer for the rest of his life for you so this is what is meant here okay another important thing howsoever the lover is treated he has to remain loyal forever this is again a very uh, unusual kind of uh, um, characteristic of courtly love uh, a lady can be cruel a lady can be uh, you know disloyal uh, may not uh, treat the lover in a fair and uh, deserving manner but the lover is still expected to remain loyal uh, we can imagine that uh, this is not possible in the modern times uh, another important characteristic of courtly love is that husband has nothing to do with this thing that we call love he is not a party to it for example the hero of a romance may love a lady without caring for her husband and his real rival would be anyone trying to love that lady okay so these are few characteristics of uh, courtly love one important thing that i hope most of you would remember was the conception of woman and i told you that there are two conceptions one is woman as eve who is supposed to be responsible for our woes and sufferings in this world and the other one is the exact opposite and that is virgin mary uh, i hope you remember when we talked about virgin mary and taso to bya di kana munga veli uche hawa bi bi bya da gya ga kam ke da christianity ki da khalku ya am che kam da khalku taso ro ba ga wakhi چې دا غیر دوج نه انسان یو داسې غلطي وکړه چې بیا مونږ د جنت نه راووتو او بیا د دنیا دا سختې زمونږ سره لشوې او بیا ورجن میری ده چې هغه د عیسی علیه السلام مور وه او د عیسایانو دا خیال و چې یاره د دې عیسی علیه السلام زمونږ دپاره قرباني ورکړه او مونږ هر څومره ګناهګاران یو خو هغه چونکې زمونږ دپاره قرباني ورکړې ده نو مونږ به په اخره کې کامیابۍ طرف ته ځو نو د دې مطلب دا شو چې په رومانس کې چونکې په هغه وخت کې د مذهب غلبه سیوا وه 
نو خلکو خزه ایسوسییت کوله د ورجن میری سره او چونکې د ورجن میری حیثیت او قد و قامت دینی لحاظ سره مذهبی لحاظ سره ډیر زیات امپورټنټ وو نو په دې وجه باندې په کوټ لی لف په دې کانسپټ کې خزه ته ډیر زیات اوچت او اعلی مقام حاصل دی د هغې سره ډیر زیات اختیارات دي په نسبت د رومانس کې چې کم میل کیریکټر یې اوکې وی ټاکټ اباؤٹ ون ایکزامپل آف آرتھیرین رومانس اینڈ دیٹ واز سر گیون اینڈ دا گرین نائٹ اینڈ ایف یو ریمبر ایف آئی ایم ٹو ریمائنڈ Uh, a quick uh, you know story uh, or the plot of the um, romance is that the green knight enters uh, arthur's court and asks for a volunteer to strike him with an axe he would provide so he would provide uh, him with an axe and uh, then he says that uh, a year and a day later a year and a day later that same night who will strike me with the x today would receive a blow in the same manner from my side so when he throws this challenge in the court all are um, silent and amazed uh, arthur himself volunteers but uh, there is a courageous and courteous sir given who steps in and uh, decides to um, take on the challenge so he is provided with an x he strikes of the head of the green knight uh, it is thrown away but uh, he just picks up his head and rides off while leaving he asked sir given to meet him in green chapel a year and a day after when the time arrives means after a year and a day given start starts off for the chapel on the way he uh, takes shelter in a castle with a lady and her lord and it's handsomely entertained he stays there for some time some days during those days the lord would go hunting and given would stay at home during his stay the lady would make advances and would tempt him to love but uh, owing to his uh, grand and uh, knightly nature he only allows her to kiss him when the time arrives for his departure the lady gives him a memento a green girdle to make him invulnerable for the green knight now when he reaches the appointed place at the appointed time and when he bows in front of the green knight to receive his blow he flinches at first blow then steadies and gets a little wound on his neck surprisingly the green knight reveals himself to be the lord of the castle and he also adds that the wound that the sir given has received from him is for his lady's girdle at this given feels humiliated and we see that this story is also a story of um, of moral failure so this is all about uh, this uh, arthurian romance given in the green knight 
There are other good romances in your books which you can find like King Horn, Havlik the Dan. And uh, with this we come to our uh, today's discussion. Uh, I hope uh, it was not a bad start. Uh, we uh, expect that uh, you will be listening to this uh, lecture time and again to understand. If you find that there are certain problems or difficulties or maybe being a first timer I may have made certain mistakes you can identify them please post your comments on uh, the different aspects of this lecture the things that you liked about the lecture the things that you found interesting in the history the things that uh, you did not understand uh, that will give me a chance to further explain my point uh, hope to see you next week in the next class with uh, a fresh lecture. Stay home, stay safe. Assalamu alaikum.